All right. Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining me. Today we're going to be going through a very commonly heard of virus. It's called the rotavirus. Um, now, personally, I have had the rotavirus and I was hospitalized when I was about two years old. Um, I had severe diarrhea and gastrointestinal issues, which led to an electrolyte imbalance, as well as severe dehydration. So I actually had to be hospitalized because of this virus. Um, but we'll see how this was a pretty common thing for uh, very young infants um, here about 20 years ago. But now the prevalence has gone down a relatively good amount. Uh, and we'll kind of walk through why that is. Um, we'll also just do a little bit of a background on the rotavirus in general. So once again, thanks for joining Hope you learned something new today. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so our goals for the day um, are sixfold, I guess. I've got six uh, specific uh, statements. We're going to go through the classification, um, so the taxonomy of the rotavirus. We're going to go through the discovery, who discovered it and where and how and why. Uh, we'll look through the structure, and based on that structure, we're going to look through the function and the mechanism of infection of the rotavirus. And then finally, we're going to look through the epidemiology, uh, so where it's occurring, uh, how it's spread, uh, and the statistics of that, as well as identifying the treatment and prevention options, which are uh, pretty widespread now. Um, so hopefully we can continue to uh, expand upon those. <coughs> Sorry, I got a little bit of a cold here. Okay, so... First off, this is a double-stranded RNA virus, and that is a characteristic of this family, Rio Viridae. Um, so as you can see over here in this table, this is a great, great evolutionary table, by the way. I highly recommend this. This is from this website, Antiviral and Telestrat. Um, and it shows kind of the similarities uh, between a bunch of different viruses. Uh, so you've probably heard of her the herpes virus, um, as well as like hepatitis E virus and those types of things. Well, we're over here with double-stranded RNA. So when we're talking about dsRNA, uh, it's two strands of RNA, which normally we think of RNA as single-stranded, but this actually has a complement to it. So it will be kind of packed in, similar to what our DNA looks like, but with RNA molecules. Um, <clears throat> so they will just be slightly different. Um, and the genus uh, rotavirus uh, was named after a wheel. So rota, uh, if we think of like rotors or rotation, we think of a circle or a wheel. So this is called the wheel virus, as you can see kind of looks like a wheel under a mic, uh, electron microscope. Um, so some of the characteristics of this family, once again, family, not genus, um, is an icosahedral. I had to look this one up. It's a 20-sided polyhedron, so it's got 20 faces, um, and they're, they're all kind of equally distant from each other. Um, so it's kind of a cool structure, but kind of freaky when you think of it as a virus. It looks really, like, alienated. <laughs> um, this is also a non-enveloped virus. So it's not covered by a lipid membrane, which actually makes it really difficult to attack with, like, disinfectants and those types of things. They have to be very specialized for that. Um, they're also segmented. And when I say segmented, I mean the genome is very segmented. So each segment, I believe there's 11 in uh, rotavirus, each one has a specific gene that it will code for. Um, and since it's a double-stranded RNA um, <clears throat> within that uh, plasma, let's see, within the virion, virinon, um, those segments will come out in very distinct strips, and we'll be able to see those here in the structure in a second. <clears throat> so first off, let's talk about the discovery, uh, and this is a fun one. So this is uh, Ruth Bishop, and I actually didn't realize this, but she passed away last year in 2020. She was a really big leading biochemist in Australia. This was found in Melbourne. Uh, I've got friends up here near Sydney. Uh, so Melbourne, Australia, she discovered this with a group of colleagues. Um, and she named it after the wheel structure, and they found it. So with any uh, microbiology and checking for viruses, you have to isolate that sample from infected people. Um, and they found them in these mature epithelial cells of patients that were suffering from gastroenteritis, like diarrhea um, and just throwing up, those types of things. <clears throat> and they found that the common thread was this rotavirus. And so this is a picture of her when she was younger, uh, but once again, she passed away last year. So thank you, Ruth Bishop, uh, for figuring out what disease really nearly killed me personally. <laughs> so uh, I owe a lot to her. <clears throat> so moving on from there, if my slideshow will go, we're going to look into the structure, not too detailed. Uh, I just want to give a, a brief overview. So once again, we're looking at this icosahedral shape. It doesn't show here as well, but this is just a depiction from the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. 
Um, and this will help us understand the um, entry of the virus. So when we're looking at this virus, we've got the outer capsid, that's the word I was looking for earlier, um, with several different viral proteins. And we'll see that these will be uh, mediated by a clathrin-coated endocytosis here in a second. Uh, so these proteins will actually act as attaching to those intestinal cells. And then the intestinal cells will be like, hey, this is a friendly thing, and then kind of bring it in. And then obviously the virus will be, be able to take over. <clears throat> but we've got coverage with viral protein 8, 5, and 7. <clears throat> Intermediately, uh, there's a VP6. And then as you move closer in, uh, the VP2 will be surrounding that inner capsid. Um, <clears throat> we've also got some proteins. Uh, so these deal with, um, oh gosh, RNA polymerases. Uh, so RNA polymerase, um, this is what will attach to those segments of RNA within the plasma as you can see, or as inside the capsid. So you can see there's several segments and each one will code for a specific gene within the virus. So I was right, there are 11 and you can kind of see each one being kind of parceled out within the virus. Um, and each one will actually be activated at different times during the viral life cycle, which is highly regulated um, and evil because they're viruses and they want to infect our host cells. So it's just a brief overview of what they look like. Oh, there's RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. I was thinking about it, but I had it written right there. So that's what that stands for. And those will attach to RNA and transcribe them. Let's move my face around. <clears throat> so the mechanism of infection, as I mentioned before, this is through clathrin-coded pits or clathrin-coded endocytosis. Say that five times fast. Um, as the virus comes into the cell, we'll go over this and then I'll walk through kind of how it uh, occurs. Um, so once again, this VP4 protein on the virus, if I go back one slide, if it lets me, um, the VP4 isn't actually shown here, but it is on the surface of this virus. And based on Lundgren and Spenson's work, uh, this uh, VP4 protein will attach to um, receptors. I believe it's the SGLT1 receptors on intestinal cells. It's more in the upper gastrointestinal tract. Um, in dynamin, which is a, a uh, kind of a movement protein, it kind of pinches it off, as you can see here, as the virus makes its way into the cell. It will infect, I guess I should say, um, early endosomes, which will turn into late endosomes. And this almost prevents the virus from being detected by lysosomes. Now, sometimes endosomes will actually turn into lysosomes and like break things down. But in this case, uh, it kind of prevents it based on how fast uh, the virus begins to mobilize, which is relatively quickly. It's about a 12-hour incubation period, so it doesn't, it doesn't take too long. <clears throat> and eventually, as this virus grows, it'll put out its RNA sequence um, and get trans, uh, translated into viral proteins by ribosomes within the cell. And then, as we all know, the cell may die and burst based on... Uh, how much virus is within the cell, and then the virus can go infect other things. Uh, so that's kind of the mechanism of infection. Uh, like I said, it kind of gets in here, gets protected and in the endosome, and then does its virus things to <coughs> proliferate, create its proteins, and make more viruses. Now, I can't talk about the mechanism of infection without talking about how the virus got in the body in its first place. And it's by feces to mouth contact. Now, when we think about this, when does this ever happen, right? Poop to mouth doesn't happen. Well, let's think about infants. Let's think about how small these viruses are and how little you need on your hand in order to get into your body. And toddlers are constantly touching things with their hands. This is also common in nursing homes, just with uh, if things aren't fully disinfected all the time. This can occur relatively frequently. Uh, we'll see that here in a second. But once it gets inside, that's when all of these mechanisms will occur. And once again, as this virus proliferates and you see all these dots in here, um, it will induce kind of this inflammatory response. So these dendrites will receive the signal that, oh, my gosh, like this intestine's getting kind of wonky. Uh, we should check this out. So then sends a bunch of, it sends a bunch of white blood cells, those types of things, glucocytes, lymphocytes, into that area, inducing uh, inflammatory response. And that's what leads to kind of the diarrhea um and the vomiting in some cases as well um, but luckily they will also be on the attack to heal the body from these uh issues <clears throat> so let's talk about the epidemiology and the prevalence a little bit now that we've talked about how it gets into the body 
Um, as I mentioned before, it mainly affects six to twelve, twenty six to twenty four month olds, um, based on Crawford's work, um, and it actually causes over six hundred thousand deaths per year, which is a lot uh, worldwide. Uh, but at the same time, there's about seven billion people, so it's not a ton. Um, <clears throat> but the issue here is it's not that the uh, virus directly kills people; it's that it induces such an inflammatory response that diarrhea and vomiting uh, depletes the body of hydration and electrolytes, leading to death, especially in these little kids who can't keep their fluid uh, intake regular. Um, so they usually have to be put on IVs um, if they get too sick uh, so that they can restore that. Um, and this surprised me when researching the CDC said about 95% of adults have been infected with this at some point. It may have just manifested as like a 24 hour flu, but it's actually kind of the rotavirus, but once you get it, I'll show you in a second, uh, you're usually protected from it for the rest of your life for the most part. It just depends on the uh, strain. So it's very incredibly widespread, but now we've got a vaccine. Uh, I missed the punchline here in a second, but before the vaccine, there were a ton of cases per year, and this is uh, in the United States specifically. <clears throat> so there's 2.7 million cases a year. Once again, 95% of children, which turn into adults, obviously, who turn into adults. Um, but after the vaccine, we've got a ton of clinic visits averted, a ton of hospitalizations can, uh, averted. So let's talk about that care and prevention with vaccines specifically. Um, so there is a vaccine for kids, uh, two to four months old. Uh, there's two different ones. Uh, I believe both of them require uh, two doses. Uh, one is oral and one is, I believe, an injection. Um, and so when you give this uh, kid um, <clears throat> the virus or it's a live virus, but it's weakened, um, so they develop antibodies at a very young age. It's unlikely that they'll develop a severe infection, and a lot, a lot of the times they do develop full immunity um, based on the Mayo Clinic's data. Um, and aside from the vaccine, there's really <laughs> no way to avoid this. Uh, now, they put together a few different things that you can do to prevent yourself from getting rotavirus infection, like frequent hand washing, rehydration, and electrolyte replenishment during infection. So this is more of a care. Um, and then these, these two are more uh, prevention. So frequent hand washing, clean and disinfecting, but again, it's primarily uh, a react, a reactory sort of thing. So you have to react to this by uh, staying hydrated and attempting to keep your immune system strong so that when you do get this infection, it can fight it off rather quickly. Um, in fact, one of the studies that I was reading uh, said that you literally only need two to three virus particles um, to get sick. So, I mean, you think of fecal matter and how many billions of viruses are in just one little thing of fecal matter. Uh, it's really not that hard to just get a little bit in your system. Um, and I also read that this rotavirus specifically can stay on surfaces for up to two months uh, inactive. Um, and once you kind of swipe it up with your hand, maybe put your hand in your eye, hand in your mouth, um, that can lead to infection. Um, so, once again, this is more about uh, caring for it in response, uh, as well as preventing it through the vaccine. That's the biggest thing that we can do. Um, but overall, uh, we're still going to send our kids to daycare. People are still going to go to nursing homes. So, it's unlikely that we can completely eradicate this virus because it is so widespread and because it's so transmissible. Um, so, we can do our best, uh, but obviously, nothing is perfect. Um, so yeah, this is the presentation on the rotavirus. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if we go back to our objectives real quick, we went through the classification. So remember that family, uh, the icosahedral structure, uh, that's kind of the basis of that family, as well as the rotavirus is the genus. Um, and there's no, we don't really talk about species with uh, the virus in this case, because it's a very general virus and there's several different strains, um, <clears throat> but we don't talk about those specifically. Um, we talked about uh, Ruth Bishop and her discovery in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Bishop or Dr. Bishop. Uh, we looked at the structure and the mechanism of infection based on the structure of the rotavirus. Uh, very briefly, quick overview. And we talked about the epidemiology, the prevalence, as well as prevention and treatment options. Uh, so I hope you learned something new. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you wash your hands and keep your kids healthy. And uh, oh, before I forget, just common precaution, if uh, you do have a child, an infant that's uh, vomiting, having a lot of diarrhea uh, for more than 24 hours. 
go to the doctor um, just in case uh, because it might be rotavirus infection and can lead to death in some cases. So better safe than sorry, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for watching.